book of Matthew, chapter 19, again, verses 1 through 10 today. So this is marriage and divorce, part two. I, I, I hate to say the word divorce. Not only do, is it unpleasant, I hate to say it. God hates divorce, and I also believe that anybody in this room who has ever been divorced also really hates divorce. I've never heard anybody brag about it or say good and glowing things about it. Uh, so we bring no condemnation to anybody today, no matter what you've been through in your life and no matter for what reason. What we seek today is that all of us would walk away from here enlightened as to God's design for marriage, God's design for his people, and that we would from this day forward walk according to God's design and purpose, regardless of where we've come from in the past. Would you rise with me, please, if you're able to today, as I read in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, our text today. Matthew 19, verses 1 through 10. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, and saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever, whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. His disciples said to him, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Lord God, I'm just not buying that it's better not to marry. And I'm thinking you have a deeper lesson for us here. We ask you to give us some wisdom into this today and to teach us and convince us and bring it home to us that your design is that marriage is permanent, the permanence of marriage. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks. Please have a seat. Hey, Ryan, did I turn on the audio on that remote thing on the side there? Good. Thank you. I almost did like Paul on the Areopagus at Mars Hill in Athens, where he started quoting Greek philosophers and Greek poets. And uh, I was inspired by an American poet about this message today. And I was going to put it on the screen, and we were going to have it, and it's actually a song. And, uh, but then I just thought we could not compete with Dave Pischel, who sang to us several times the other week when I was gone, so we're not going to do that. But this, this, I'm going to read just a little bit of this poem, this song, by I think, uh, I think the message uh, is very searching, very haunting, and it's pop music, I get that. It's actually kind of Motown, but uh, this is Al Green. And he says, I'm so in love with you. Whatever you want to do is all right with me. Because you make me feel so brand new. And I, I want to spend my life with you. Maybe you've been inspired like that in your life at some time. Somebody that just made you feel so brand new. Like a new person. And, and you just, all you could 
think about is, I want to spend my life with this person. He says, let me say that since, baby, since we've been together, loving you forever is what I need. Let me be the one you come running to. I'll never be untrue. Okay, so it's pop music. But this almost comes straight out of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, the solemnization of marriage, wedding ceremony, that I just did a couple weeks ago for Kevin and Nora. He says, loving you forever is what I need, forever in his mind, until I die. So he says, let's stay together, loving you whether times are good or bad, happy or sad. Why? Somebody tell me. Why do people break up and then they turn around and make up? I just can't see. You'd never do that to me, would you, baby? Just being around you is all I see. So here's what I want us to do, he says. He's, He's like a good man in the relationship saying, This is where I want to take this relationship. He's taking leadership there. He says, let's, yeah, we ought to stay together. Loving you whether times are good or bad, happy or sad. Come on, let's stay together. Loving you whether times are good or bad, happy or sad. In sickness and in health for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, says the book of prayer. So says Al Green. (laughs) I spared you singing it myself. So, Lord, we thank you for your tender mercies today. (laughs) It's one of my favorite songs. Because here's an American poet, an American singer who captured the essence of the design of marriage by God Almighty. It's designed for us to stay together, loving you forever, when times are good, when they're bad, when they're happy, or when they're sad. And baby, you'd never leave me, would you? Just for a moment there, there's this this thought of, you wouldn't... um, Would you? The emphatic answer of every one of God's people should always be, no, baby, I would never, ever leave you. I'm here till one of us draws their last breath. And that could be you or that could be me. But this is till death us do part. And so today we speak of the permanence of marriage. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that our nation is messed up about marriage. I was talking with one of my family members the other day about this, who are my family members, by the way, are my, some of my best counselors about these sermons. And that includes my children. And we were asking ourselves, you know, when did it start to go south? for marriage in America. And, you know, it was easy to say, like, oh, I don't, you know, uh, the feminist movement, uh, et cetera, in the 1970s. And no, you go before that, and there's the there's the contraceptives and the free love, free sex kind of movement in the 60s. And, oh, wait, 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 it goes back before that, too. And the... Uh, immorality that was brought back by some of the soldiers from World War II who had gotten maybe too absorbed in the occupation of France after the war and so No, 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 wait, it goes back before that. And we keep going back and back and back. What is it? Some government action? Is it some church action? Is it some kind of godlessness? One of the things that we looked at was that, you know, maybe, maybe, did you know that adultery 
and fornication used to be against the law in the United States. They were criminal offenses. You could be fined. You could be sent to jail for premarital sex. You could be sent to jail for adultery. And certainly, if a divorce ever came up and somebody could point the finger and bring a legitimate claim of, wait a sec, you broke this marriage covenant. You, you went out and had an affair with somebody else and you're unrepentant about it and it's repeated. That, that played a large factor in the divorce at that point. And it's only quite recently that we got into, and we talked about it last week a little bit, this business of no-fault divorce. I was looking at some, just some of our laws, even some of our laws that are still on the books now. You may not know this, but in South Carolina... Any man or woman who shall be guilty of the crime of adultery or fornication shall be liable to indictment and on conviction shall be severally punished by a fine of not less than $100 nor more than $500 or imprisonment for not less than six months nor more than one year or by both fine and imprisonment at the discretion of the court. Adultery is defined as the living together in carnal intercourse with each other or habitual carnal intercourse with each other without living together of a man and woman when either is lawfully married to some other person. Who knew that was still against the law there? When do you suppose is the last time that was enforced? And this is on the books in state after state after state. We don't so much uh, follow our laws as just ignore them at our peril. And same thing in Minnesota, fine of $3,000. In Arizona, uh, same thing. In many, many states around the country. The, so I looked up the most common reasons for divorce that are listed by divorcees in the United States. And now granted, this is, this is what they say about their own personal divorce. It's not what other people are saying is really happening. But num the number one cause is money, arguments over money. The second one is lack of intimacy. The third one is adultery. That's only number three. Then comes abuse, then lack of compatibility. Lack of compatibility. That sort of sounds like we fight like cats and dogs. Physical appearance is number six. Physical appearance, really. Generally, that it takes the form of we got married and you were slim and trim and then you put on 120 pounds in the first 10 years and I don't like the way you look and I'm not attracted to you anymore and I, I, I and me, me, me. But we got married at too early of an age. We got married for the wrong reasons or lack of communication. Almost, no, almost nobody, in the, like in the first 10, here's what you don't see but which we suspect is a greater occurrence. I just don't love you anymore. You realize almost nobody actually says that as the reason for their divorce when they're asked by a third party. But how often is it really true? Or how about this? You annoy me. I want a divorce because you are so annoying. Just can't stand to be in the same room with you. I feel trapped. I want to chase adventure. I want freedom. You don't meet my expectations. You are a workaholic. You ignore me. You ig ignore the children. What is a common theme through almost every one of these things? I, me, my desires, my wants, my selfishness. So we tried something in America for a while. And there was this movement that got started in Arizona called Covenant Marriage. Maybe you heard about this. It started back in the 90s by some well-meaning churches that said, hey, you know what? We need to go back to the way it was before, where it wasn't easy to get out of a marriage, where there were you know, more, more of a binding legal effect on marriage. And so we want to take away this no-fault divorce for some people who voluntarily enter into what we'll call a covenant marriage, which is saying, hey, um, I want to sign up for a different kind of marriage with, that's covered under different kinds of laws. It's not marriage, it's super marriage. It's covenant marriage. And so they started this covenant marriage, and the idea was this. You had to get pre premarital counseling sessions first, which emphasized the nature and the purposes and the responsibilities of marriage, and you had to sign a statement declaring that this covenant marriage is for life. 
and uh, basically renouncing no-fault divorce, that you had to bring a divorce for cause, and this was going to be the solution to the divorce rate in America. And the number of people who signed up for that, and it, it was in three states, it was in Arizona, Arkansas, and Louisiana, the number of people, it rose to almost 5% of new applications for marriage for a while. Then it quickly fell down to 1%. And then less than 1%. And it's basically, even though it's still on the books, it's basically fallen into complete disuse now. And what was the effect of it? Well, it did have some effect upon, marriage, upon divorce rates. It, it, there was a correspondence with a lowered divorce rate. But most people think that that was because those are people who were exceptionally dedicated to marriage in the first place. I mean, you have to kind of jump some hurdles to sign this this covenant marriage contract. And so they were generally more religious people to begin with, more committed to some kind of faith, be it Christian or other. And uh, they were already a part of, of covenant communities which frowned upon divorce. And in divorce in those communities is much lower in the first place. So who knows? But meanwhile, divorce marches on. And we saw... We saw last week that Jesus, uh, it came to pass, verse chapter 19, verse 1, that Jesus had finished these sayings. And we asked, what sayings? And we went through this whole chapter 18. These were very difficult sayings, very difficult teachings that Jesus bought, brought to the people. And they were actually quite offensive to the people, and yet they pursued him even as he crossed over from, uh, from Galilee into Judea. They still, in spite of those hard teachings that he gave them, they still chased him down. And then the Pharisees, Pharisees came in verse 3, and they tried to trap him into something that could actually result in the death penalty for him with the, the king in Judea where he just went to. And he didn't go for the trap. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And the idea there is, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason that the man chooses? And Jesus didn't take the bait, and we saw that. And he responded to them with the creation account from Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And he, didn't, he wouldn't answer their question in the way that they wanted it answered. He asked them, haven't you read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? Now this word male and female as presented there and as presented in uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, male and female he created them. The words male and female are in the emphatic position in the sentence, meaning this, meaning that the emphasis in Genesis was not on the fact that God made them, and it was not on the fact that he made them in his image. It was on the fact that he made them male and female. The greatest emphasis is on the maleness and on the femaleness of that entire creation there. Yes, he made them in his image, but there's a strong emphasis on, on what? Why would he say male and female? Because here's what happens with male and female. It's two it's not three. Two people who are radically opposite to each other, meant to be opposite, meant to be different, designed in different ways, made from different stuff. Adam was made from dirt, and Eve was made from Adam's side, this large chunk of bone and flesh and blood and muscle dripping there, and God fashioned it into something perfect as a helper for Adam. And then Adam responded, he responded like Al Green. I wish that we had the tune to this song, but it's, a, it's constructed as a song in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. And Adam said, oh, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. He was not preaching. He was singing there. The man was inspired to poetry. He was inspired to song. Like Al Green, baby, let's stay together. I'll love you forever. When times are good or bad, happy or sad, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then both Jesus and the Lord in Genesis say this, say this, 
For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And when we did a marriage ceremony just a couple of weeks ago at Calvary Chapel, Joshua Springs in California, Kevin and Nora took, took jars of sand and mixed them together in a third jar there, and they put a cap on it. And it represented that as all this sand mixes together and cannot be separated intelligibly one from another, now, from whatever source it came, it is one jar of sand. You cannot pick it apart. And so it is in God's design that it is impossible. In God's design, staying in accordance with God's will to try to pick apart the man from the woman, it cannot be done and remain in the will of God. So what, to get, what therefore God has joined together that no man separate? They said to him, when did, why did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? And of course, he didn't command anything, any such thing. Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. We're going to look at, a, we're going to look at that passage here in Deuteronomy. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Verse 1, you can turn with me there if you wish. Deuteronomy 24, verse 1 says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house, when she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her as his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Find for me in there, please where Moses commanded the man to put a certificate of divorce in anybody's hand. It's all, if you do this, and when this happens, nowhere does it say if you find uncleanness in her, you shall put a certificate of divorce in her hand. Does not say that. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it, by the way, it doesn't say when a, when a woman takes a husband and marries him. The man is the leader here. He's the accountable one before God. He is the one who answers to God for the sanctity of this marriage. The man creates the home, the home environment. The man is responsible for the spiritual integrity of that marriage. He's supposed to be the leader. I believe with all my heart that every man who has ever been married will be called before God someday and ask this. What did you do with the wife that I gave you? And his wife is not going to be standing next to him to bail him out there. He needs to answer alone for that. And I believe every wife is going to be called before the judgment throne of God as well and ask the same or a similar question. And her husband will not be standing next to her to help her out with excuses and so on. Each one of us answers for this, but the man takes the wife and he marries her and if it happens, he says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes. Why? Because he finds some uncleanness in her. Does it say adultery? No. Does it say sexual immorality? No. It says some uncleanness. What could that uncleanness be? It could be as petty as anything that the man wanted to do back then. He had the legal right to divorce her because she put too much salt on the food. Literally, this is actually mentioned in Jewish texts back then. Or if she spun around too quickly in the marketplace and her skirt popped up a little bit and men could see her ankles, he could divorce her for that. Or if she dared to let down her hair and a man could see her hair let down, he could divorce her for that. For any reason or for no reason at all. And nowhere here in the Old Testament does God say that he permits that or blesses that, let alone that he commands that. What God does in the Old Testament is he regulates it. 
And so if your heart is so hard, the Bible is saying, if you are so hard that you would, that you would condemn your wife for something so petty as too much salt on the food, or spinning around and showing her ankles in public by accident, or for some other thing that you deem to be uncleanness, if you are so petty as to do that, here's what you need to do to protect, to protect your wife. Oh, you hard-hearted man. You need to give her a certificate that says you are free to remarry. And for her own protection, she was given that writ of divorce. That is the only reason. If she was guilty of adultery, she would have been taken out directly and be stoned. So we have this concept today that back in the Old Testament, they were divorcing each other because of adultery. And that is not the case. You did not get a divorce because of adultery in the Old Testament. What you got was a sentence of death. There were no people, survivors of divorce, who caused the divorce divorced by their adultery, they did not survive. So if you found a divorced person, you say, what was the cause of divorce? Uh, adultery. Where does your ex-wife live? Well, she lives over there in this other state. I see. There was no such thing as an ex-wife or an ex-husband because of divorce. They were a late wife or a late husband. And that's how that worked. So this plays into Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Well, how could that be? Well, here's what happened. There were actually, in Jesus' time, there were actually divorces for the purpose of adultery, for the reason of adultery, and the person was not stoned to death. Why not? It goes like this, the right of exercising capital punishment autonomously, even over their own countrymen, was withdrawn from the Jews by the Romans in the first century. That is, in in the time of Christ, starting about 6 BC, actually. The precise date is controversial, but the limits are clear. By E.R. Goodenough notes that the Greeks in Cyrene were allowed by Augustus Caesar in a decree of 6 BC Full judicial rights in everything short of the death penalty. The death penalty was reserved only to the Roman governor, the Roman prefect of the district. The Jewish people could not declare a death penalty of themselves. They could go to the Roman governor like they did when they wanted to condemn Jesus to death. They could go to Pontius Pilate and say, crucify him, crucify him. And at one point, and Pilate said, I find no guilt in this man. Crucify him, crucify him. He says, no, you do it yourself. And they said in John, it's recorded in the Gospel of John, we are not permitted by law to crucify him. You do it. And rightly did they say we are not permitted by law to crucify him, so you do it. So the Jews had lost the right of inflicting capital punishment when Palestine became a Roman province. Others believe that the Jewish courts were allowed some exceptional privilege in this matter until the Jewish revolt was crushed and the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70, but I'm not buying it. Because in John, in the Gospel of John, they said, we're not allowed to do this thing. And so, there were several reasons allowable for divorce, as Jesus taught this, And Jesus followed the holiness code. The holiness code in Leviticus chapter 18 reads like this. If a man commits adultery with his wife, the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. If a man lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood is upon them. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them shall be uh, both of, of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death. You shall kill the animal. If a man takes his sister, a daughter of his father, or a daughter of his mother, 
and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace. They shall be cut off in the sight of the children of their people. All of these things are summed up when Jesus says this. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. What was he referring to by the sexual immorality? All of those things I just listed in Leviticus. Unrepentant homosexuality, unrepentant bestiality, unrepentant incest, and so on. Those are the things which you could survive and not be stoned because the Jews did not have the privilege of stoning. So Jesus now, he does not approve. Jesus regulates. He's not blessing divorce. He's regulating it. Paul later will go further and add one more thing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 through 16, to the rest I say, I not the Lord, meaning I'm not quoting Jesus, but this teaching is still God, God breathed, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Let's just pause there for a minute. How does that happen? The unbelieving husband is made holy. The unbelieving wife is made holy. The children are made holy by the presence of one believing spouse. What is the definition of a Christian home? Everybody is a Christian in that home? No, right here God is saying this. If there is one believer among the husband and wife, that is a Christian home. That is a believing home. And there's something sanctified and holy about that entire house. Women, you may be a wife at home with an unbelieving husband. And you wonder, when are we going to finally have a Christian home? Stop asking that question. You have a Christian home today. It is a holy home. It is sanctified. You bring the presence of Christ into that marriage. You bring Jesus to those children you bring the possibility of salvation to them. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved or is not bound to the marriage. But God has called you to peace. So he's saying, if the unbeliever insists on going, you're free. You've done nothing wrong. Let them go if they leave because of your faith, if they are so annoyed with you because you pray, if they are so annoyed with you because you bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Let them go. You are not bound to that marriage anymore. You are free to divorce and remarry is the way I read this. If anybody disagrees, I'd be very happy to have a discussion about it. I'd be very happy to receive input on that. But God has called you to peace For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? We don't save anybody. He's speaking metaphorically here. The idea is this. You can't save your husband. You can't save your wife. But you can live in a way that sanctifies that home. And that kind of sanctification may be the key that brings your unbelieving spouse to Jesus Christ. But here I do see in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I do see an allowance here for the possibility that abandonment can be a justification for divorce. It spells it out, abandonment. What might that abandonment look like today? Can you actually abandon somebody and still live in the house? Does abandonment have to mean you've left the house? I see nothing in Scripture that says a house has something to do with this. The Lord speaks of If they choose to leave, can you stay in the same house and still leave? That's the question. I may be wrong on this. I invite your your feedback on this, but I'm inclined to believe that if somebody lives with you in the same house and they physically abuse you, they have left you. 
If somebody lives in the same house with you and this is your spouse and they refuse to have physical relations with you, they have left you. They have abandoned you. If somebody lives in the same house with you and they completely ignore you as if you did not exist, have they not left you? What should a person do who has been abused by a spouse? First, for the record, report it to the police. Report it immediately and testify against that person. A second off, the, the, abuse, the abusive spouse should be reported to church leadership for correction and hopefully to bring his or her soul back into conformity with God's will, to allow them the opportunity to repent. But if they refuse to repent, we just learned in Matthew chapter 18, what do you do with the person in the church who refuses to repent? You go to them a second time and a third time in an accelerated way, and you, you offer them the opportunity to repent. But if they refuse, then you put them out of the church, and they shall be as a what to you? A heathen, unbeliever. He shall be as an unbeliever to you. So now you find yourself living with an unbeliever. Maybe they're not technically an unbeliever. But we're told in the scripture, you shall treat them as an unbeliever. So now do you have a, possibly do you have a situation where even though that person claims to be a Christian, They've been declared by the church leadership to be as an unbeliever. And now you're living with an unbeliever who has abandoned you. And this is, this is my conviction on the matter. I could be wrong, but I've studied it. This is, this is the teaching that I'm bringing to you today. I believe that if you live with that person in your home, and they've been declared by the church to be as an unbeliever, and they t- treat you in a way that, that is like this abandonment that we're talking about, that you have the right to divorce and remarry. That's, a, that's saying a lot coming from a former Catholic. And there's nobody, I think, that values marriage more than me. And I'm just as heartbroken as any person to ever see a divorce happen. But, but know that God does not bind you into a situation of torment to live with somebody who's unrepentant adulterer to live with somebody who's un- unrepentant homosexual, to live with somebody who's unrepentant in abuse to you. In the former times, that person would be dead because of the capital punishment. These are all things that qualified for capital punishment. So why just because man's law change, changes does God's law change? All these abusers, these engaging in homosexuality, engaging in adultery, engaging in physical abuse, and so on, if they would have been put to death under Jewish law, why should we regard them as alive under under our law today? Just because the government has removed that ability. I know this is a complicated thing that I'm going into here. But somebody needs to bring a little bit of clarity to this. Many of you find yourselves divorced. And it's, there's nuance, there's complications. Me as a pastor, I've wrestled with this idea, what do I do if people come to me and they have divorces in their background and they come from, and they come to be married? I don't know. Gonna have to see when it happens. I would rather err to the side of caution. This is the situation we find ourselves in when we don't have community anymore. Nobody knows anybody's history. You don't know the story behind somebody. I I did counsel some people um, a number of years ago, and they came together, and there was a, a divorce or divorces in the background, and it was presented to me in such and such a way, and I never did officiate this wedding, but it was presented in such and such a way as like, okay, the situation was like this here, and I come to find out later after a marriage had happened in a different venue that it was an entirely different situation, and I was deceived. I went to that person and said, you deceived me. And they said, yes, I deceived you, and I deceived the one I married and that happens 
that can happen because we come from different states to a, to a third. You come from Ohio, he comes from California, and you meet in Florida, and you fall in love and get married, and who knows what that history is there. I don't know. It's such a tangled web, isn't it? And so I think that the, the apostles then, they look at this, and, what they, and Jesus continues on in Matthew 19, 9. He says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And what Jesus meant there is whoever marries her who was a guilty adulteress or sexually immoral one, who was the cause of the divorce, who was the guilty one, whoever marries her who was the guilty one, quote unquote, in a divorce also commits adultery. The idea here is this. If you're, if you're the one who caused the breakup because of your, your immorality, then no matter who initiates the divorce, the way, here's the way I read this, you have lost the right to remarry. You have lost that right. I can't find any other reading for this verse 9. Whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And now the apostles kind of throw up their hands. And they're like, Lord, you have laid a whole lot of stuff on us here today. And this gets complicated. And we can't understand how to untangle all this stuff. And here's their response. His disciples said to him, well, if such is the case of the man with his wife, it's better not to marry. Can you just see them in their exasperation going, well, well then, well then, what the, what, what? Well, nobody should get married then if it's going to be that complicated. Take hope. Here's what I think they didn't get. They still think it's about the bread. They still don't get this idea that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. They still haven't grasped the concept that you can forgive adultery in somebody who has repented. They still haven't grasped the concept that even if your spouse has been sexually immoral, has broken the covenant with you, that if you are both filled with the Holy Spirit and you both repent, you can come back and Jesus can heal that marriage. If such is the case of the man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Oh, thank God that they were wrong about that. It is not better not to marry. It is not good for the man to be alone, says the Lord. And so it is usually best for you to marry. God loves marriage. And so do you. God hates divorce, and I know so do you as well. So, let's stay together. Let's stay together. Loving you whether the times are good or bad, happy or sad. Why do some people break up, turn around and make up? I just can't see. I can't see all this breaking up. You'd never do that to me, would you? I pray that if you're married today, you would never do that to your spouse. Whatever condition you find yourself in today, be content with that. But let's stay together. Loving you weather. This was a good week. I'm just here to testify this was a good week for me. So on Thursday, my wife and I celebrated 38 years of good and bad. Good, I assure you, good and bad. Happy and sad. But we stayed together. And we'll always stay together.
And I've had a wonderful conversation with a, a young lady today who's going to stay after church and be baptized. Her name is Lindsay King, right here. And she and my son, Ryan, are having serious conversations about something. And she thought it was important to come and meet Ryan's parents. I don't know why. But we've had some great talks this week. And we talked about things like, what is marriage? What is God's design for marriage? And the bottom line is this. Marriage is a good thing. Marriage is an awesome thing. Marriage is a beautiful thing. And you can stay together in good or bad, happy or sad, and God can heal any marriage no matter how corrupt it looks if two people will give up their selfishness, both of them together, coming together and saying, I can't figure out where this thing went wrong, but from here on out, I will bow the knee to Jesus Christ, have the Holy Spirit come and fill me, and let's work on this together. God will heal that marriage. So, Lord God, we thank you for marriage. And we thank you that this is the picture of salvation. This is the picture of church and the Christ, the, the groom and the, and the bride. Thank you, Lord, that you will never break up with us. That you stay with us when times are good and bad, happy and sad through thick and thin, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. Oh, you're a good, good God. We bless you for our salvation. And now we're going to go celebrate the salvation of a relatively new believer with baptism in that courtyard right after this service, whoever wants to join us. We ask you, God, to, to bless our sister Lindsay. And fill her with your Holy Spirit and give her a heart that would continue to chase after you relentlessly, pursuing you, pursuing your truth. May we also pursue you like a spouse in love. We want to spend our life with you, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen.